is the war within. And this is part two. Last week we looked at the term the, the flesh. We looked at Paul's expression, a law within, a law in my members. And we're going to continue looking at that. We, to understand what we need to do to be sanctified, we have to understand the enemy. And we have to understand the fight we're in. And I'm going to uh, read Romans uh, chapter 7. And uh, my text is going to be <clears throat> 23. No, you're not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. How that a man, law hath, the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. <clears throat> for the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she married, be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin that were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, not the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of consupience, for without the law sin was dead. <coughs> For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would not, that do I not. But that what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I can send unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would do, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I, if I do that which I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. <clears throat> I find that a law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But... I see a law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. The last time we looked at the meaning of the term flesh, we looked at the law within, and we're continuing to look at that. And I'm at my third point regarding the law of sin. So third, this law of sin, and we just read about it in Romans 7, resides in the heart of believers. Therefore, it is easy to insinuate itself in all that we do and to hinder all that is good. And to further all sin and wickedness, it has an intimacy and inwardness with the soul, and therefore, in all that we do, it does easily beset us. This is why sanctification can be difficult. This is why we find that we do things we don't like at all. We hate. Jeremiah the prophet says this in uh, 17, 9 to 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart is unsearchable. And we don't even know our own, own hearts. How many Christians have thought, well, I've had a, they've had a particular victory over this sin or this lust problem, uh, only to discover that it still lies within ready to strike? 
How many believers subdue one particular sin and then find that another has come to take its place? Well, much of its security and consequently of its stealth lies in this, that it is past finding out. The temptations that have come before believers have no power in themselves. Okay, the devil can't force you to sin. A temptation that's external to you cannot force you to commit sin. But they become strong when they tap, tap into the depravity that is present within our heart. And that's the problem. Okay, the problem is us. The problem is us. <clears throat> One can study his heart with all diligence to discover its trickery and deceit. But one can never really know how it employs all its deceits in the service of sin. <clears throat> and once again, the man, the person to study on this is uh, Sin and Temptation by John Owen. It abounds in contradictions, so that it is not to be found and dealt with according to any constant rule and way of procedure. Because of its nature, its inscrutability, its stealth, and deceit, Christians are often dumbfounded and ashamed at the speed and success in polluting the thought life. Okay, one minute you're instructing a young lady on the wonders of the gospel, the beauty of Christ, the infallibility of Scripture, the perfection of Scripture, and then in an instant, lustful thoughts enter the mind. That's what we have to deal with. How many believers find themselves struggling against polluted thoughts of sexual lust or hatred or envy during the public worship of a thrice holy God? And how many of us, when we're praying to God, have to fight against these thoughts coming into our mind? During prayer, during your private prayer. <clears throat> a, Christian heart, a Christian's heart often appears to abound in contradictions, and that's what Paul is discussing so vividly in Romans chapter 7. Before the fall into sin, the mind's objection to God was the spring of the orderly and harmonious motion of the soul and all the wheels in it. Okay, before sin entered in, it was just natural to love and serve God. But that was disturbed by sin. And the rest of the faculties move cross and contrary to one another. The will chooses not to do the good which the mind discovers. The affections delight not in that which the will chooses, but all jar and therefore uh, interfere and rebel against each other. This is what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 7. What a mess! What was once wonderful and harmonious before the fall is now a polluted, jumbled mess. Now, keep in mind, after our glorification, it'll be even better than it was before the fall because although Adam was perfectly good and without sin, Adam had the ability to sin. Once we're glorified, we not only go back to being uh, perfect ethically and with no enticements to sin or no temptations to sin, but we lose the ability to sin because our natures will be so transformed by Christ that it won't even be a possibility. <clears throat> now the purpose of carefully noting the depravity of our hearts it's not to despair or give up hope. And it emphatically, it's not given as an excuse to commit sin. Paul would never do that. He's not arguing, well, this is the way you are. It's just rough. You, you know, you're going to sin. You might as well sin. That's not what he's saying. <clears throat> the purpose <clears throat> is to awaken in Christians. Uh, it's to awaken us to diligent watchfulness, to dependence upon the Holy Spirit, to a diligent prayer life, and a diligent life of putting off the old man and putting on the new. The accusation, common among those who hold to the possibility of sinless perfection in Christians in this life, that Calvinism, that this negative view of man, this negative view of depravity, gives believers an excuse to sin by teaching such a negative view of man's heart, even after regeneration. We read the quote last week of, John o of Jonathan Edwards. It's totally unfounded. The purpose has never been to excuse sin but do soberly evaluate the warfare within. The Bible is totally realistic. The Bible deals with reality. Look, Christians, Paul says, this is the fight you're in. This is how uh, bad it is. This is what you have to face. I want you to be aware of this so you know what you're up against. He doesn't water it down or try to soften it at all. 
In warfare, it is those who underestimate the enemy's forces that often do not make adequate preparations for the battle. And that's what Paul wants us to do. Be prepared. The Calvinistic view of sanctification is a call to constant watchfulness, prayer, and effort. Here's what John Owen says. <clears throat> Upon this one hinge, we're finding out and experiencing the power and efficacy of this law of sin. Turns the whole course of our lives. Ignorance of it breeds senselessness, carelessness, sloth, security, and pride all of which the Lord's soul abhors. Eruptions into the great open, conscience-wasting, scandalous sins are from want of a due spiritual consideration of this law. Inquire then, how is it with your souls? What do you find of this law? What experience have you of its power and efficacy? Do you find it dwelling in you, always present with you, exciting itself, or putting forth its poison with faculty and easiness at all times in all your duties when you would do good? What humiliation? What self-abasement? What intenseness in prayer? What diligence? What diligence? What watchfulness does this call for at your hands? What spiritual wisdom do you need stand need of? What supplies of grace? What assistance of the Holy Ghost will be hence all, will we hence also discover? If fear we have few of us, a diligence proportional to our danger. Okay, so he's, it's a realism. This is, this is what we have to face. And Spurgeon used to like to talk about, look, if I know that my, my breast is, contains a big bag of gunpowder underneath my shirt on my breast, a big huge bag of gunpowder, am I going to go where the sparks are flying? You have to know your weak areas. Well, number three. <clears throat> okay, that, that was uh, completing the, the law that he talks about in Romans chapter 7. Another term used in Scripture to describe the fleshly nature of many Christians is the old man. Okay, we read this. The old man. Paul uses it in three of his epistles. Put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Ephesians 4.22. Here's Colossians 3.9. Do not lie to one another. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. And then Romans 6.6. 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Now the expression, the old man, refers to the inherited sinful nature from Adam that remains in believers and the corruption or habitual sin patterns acquired from a life of committing sin. So you've got that old sin nature you inherited from Adam, and then you've got this accumulation of sin patterns from youth. From youth. The old man, then, is what we are by birth and by nature. Fallen, polluted, depraved, corrupt, sinful, with a bias against God and toward evil. Here's what Charles Hodge says. This evil principle is called old because it precedes what is new, and because it is corrupt, and it is called man because it is ourselves. We are to be changed, and not merely our acts. We are to crucify ourselves. This original principle of evil is not destroyed in regeneration, but it is to be daily mortified in the conflict of a whole life. Do you understand what we're up against? Do you understand how important it is to know where we stand, where we are? Now, there are a number of things that we can ascertain regarding the old man from the Ephesians and Colossians passages. First, Note that the old man is set in opposition to the new man. Paul does, likes to do that. A similar opposition is noted by Paul when he says this, Galatians 5.17, The flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. And when Paul discusses the new man in Ephesians 4.22-23, 20, uh, 
uh, he says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which is recreated, created according to God, righteousness and true holiness. Now the Colossians passage, you know Colossians and Ephesians kind of correspond to each other. The Colossians passage <clears throat> adds the word knowledge. Uh, put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Ephesians 3, uh, Colossians 3.10. If Christians are being renewed unto knowledge, which includes righteousness, holiness, and truth, which begins in the interior life, then clearly the old man encompasses more than outward habits. The old man is the fallen nature without true righteousness, holiness, and knowledge. But while the old man is wholly evil, the new man is wholly good. He is created after the likeness of God day by day. This new creation is advancing in true righteousness and holiness. Now these terms, righteousness, holiness, and true knowledge, that harkens back to Genesis and what we were when we were created in the image of God. Here's what Thomas Goodwin writes, the Puritan. Therefore, that old man that is exhorted to be put off by law of opposition is meant that opposition, opposite corruption of nature that came in the room of it which must therefore be put off, as he exhorts, that this may be put on, which whilst it resides in the nature of man, it hinders, is renewing, and in the image of God, from coming in. Okay, who's really good? The, the modern author that's excellent on this is, of course, Jay Adams, which he emphasizes that sanctification is not merely not sinning, it's not merely putting something away. To really be sanctified, you have got to replace that old sinful habit with a new habit that's biblical. You get rid of that which is old and you replace it with something new that is lawful, that is good in its place. So that you not merely get rid of the old habit, but you develop a new habit. And then second... The old man is intimately connected with the former conduct. This refers to a believer's manner of life before he was a Christian. When he was completely dominated by the old man. <clears throat> a depraved nature which has lost righteousness, holiness, and truth leads to a depraved life. A life in which actions are not done unto God but unto self. A corrupt tree produces corrupt fruit. Everyone in the unregenerate state develops sinful habits... Some people are drug addicts. Some people are drunkards. Some people are whoremongers. Some people become thieves, habitual thieves. Some people are habitual liars. People get into their own habitual sin patterns. After a person is regenerated and definitively sanctified by Christ, the Holy Spirit progressively removes the sinful inclination of our hearts and enables us to put off this former conduct. And this is a, there is a daily mortification. Here's what Martin Lloyd-Jones says, and it's, it's really good. Quote, Although in my relationship to God, it is true to say that my old man is dead. Nevertheless, from the experimental standpoint, because of habits and practices and lack of knowledge and understanding, many of the characteristics of the old man still cling to me as the new man. Have nothing to do with the old man. Do not go on doing what you used to do, because he is dead. So once again, this, this pattern of sanctification in the New Testament, this is what you are. This is what you are. The old man is definitively dead in Christ. Christ has slain the old man. However, in, in the practical, experimental life, in your daily dealings, you still have to deal with the old man. And then third, Paul describes the old man as that which is being corrupted. The present tense indicates that the corruption of the old man is not static, but prog progressive. It's progressive. Men are born with a sinful nature, and as a result, engage in a life of sinful acts. Why do men commit, sin Why do men commit sins? Because all men are born sinners. We go forth from the womb speaking lies, David says. The practice of sinful behavior in turn contributes to the corruption of the old man. 
So there's a reciprocal relationship between who we are by nature and what we do. The inclination to sin leads to sinful behavior. Sinful behavior in turn strengthens the inclination to sin. Everyone is born with a sinful nature and thus is corrupt from birth. But as time progresses, people become more and more corrupt. People become habitual whoremongers, drunks, child molesters, drug users, rapists, murderers, liars, and so on. So a study of unregenerate mankind is a study in the progress, the progression of this corruption. <clears throat> and this is especially evident uh, when you examine people who are very rich and famous and so forth who have the ability to completely indulge their lusts. And you, you say, well, why, why do so many rock stars or, or movie stars and stuff, why do they fall apart, their lives are so corrupt? Well, they, they have that ability. <clears throat> they live disgusting, destructive lives. Well, the answer is quite simple. Why they do it? Corruption leads to sin, and sin leads to more corruption. So we have this vicious cycle. It is no wonder uh, that the unregenerate described in Romans 6.16 is slaves to sin. They're complete bondage to sin. And Paul teaches the same reality in his epistle to the Galatians. 6, 7, 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So, you're born a sinner. If you're unregenerate, you sin, you continue to sin, you develop habits, and you, you're wrapped, as it were, in chains. And as you sin, the chains become stronger and they become tighter. Now, you don't know that if you're unregenerate. You don't understand what's going on, but that's what's happening. This corruption of the old man, which is in turn, is becoming more corrupt than the unregenerate, by way of application, teaches us a very important principle. That the corruption of one's nature cannot be satisfied by committing sin by making provision with the flesh to fulfill its lusts, Romans 13, 14. This common notion among the heathen, and it's popular among the Amish, <clears throat> that one should sow the wild oats before settling down with a family, it's, it's utter foolishness. Sowing the wild uh, oats leads to a greater rate of infidelity and divorce and marriage relationships. Okay, this idea, we'll go out and have fun and get married later, put off marriage until you're 30 years old or whatever, totally bad and it leads to a higher rate of adultery. Christians who backslide and they convince themselves that a season of indulging the flesh will satisfy fleshly lusts so that they can then come back and return to a greater sanctification are deluding themselves. That's self-deception. It's the exact opposite. Committing sin does not subdue the flesh. It inflames the flesh. You're pouring gasoline on the fire. That's what you're doing. Here's what John Owen says. This is through a slate fire by wood and oil. As all the fire in the world, all the fabric of creation that is combustible being cast into the fire will not satisfy it, but increase it. So it is with satisfaction given to sin by sinning. It doth inflame and increase. So don't fall into this notion, well, hey, I'll go out and sin a bit and get it out of my system and I'll, I'll, I'll be more holy. No, it doesn't work that way. You're pouring fuel on the flames. The idea that one can satisfy the flesh by indulging in sin makes about as much sense as prescribing gluttony as a cure for obesity. <clears throat> or taking a deadly bacteria. Bacterium is a cure for an infection. Or applying a flame as a uh, cure for a serious burn. It is a satanic lie of the worst sort. It's very common. Paul warns believers, uh, see Peter warns believers, 1 Peter 2.11, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. It's a war. And Paul says, Galatians 5.13, for your bro uh, you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love serve one another. Yeah, Christ has pulled you out of the mire. Christ has saved you from your sin. Christ has eliminated the guilt penalty by taking it upon himself. But he's done this, so we'll be 
obedient. He's done this so we'll be a holy people. Now some commentators regard this verb, bitheraminon, which is translated as being corrupted to mean being destroyed. <clears throat> the verb in certain contexts can mean to destroy or perish. When used in an ethical context, it can mean, um, it usually refers to corruption or depravity, not physical destruction. However, there is a definite connection in scripture between moral depravity and destruction. Proverbs 6.32, whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. There's another shade of meaning in the word that the apostle used, and that is tending to destruction. Now normally as we use the word corrupt, we carry that meaning in our minds, do we not? When you think of, of uh, something corrupt, corrupting, it's, it's, it's rotting, it's putrefying. Corruption and decay, pollution and putrefication all go together. So that not only is the thing becoming corrupt, it is also disintegrating and moving in the direction of destruction. But of course, in this case, it's ethical destruction, it's chaos. God, through salvation, brings order to society, and sin brings destruction and chaos. A life, from, a life apart from God, and the service of sin is a life of self-inflicted soul destruction. Listen to what Paul says. In Romans chapter 1, 126 to 27. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. <clears throat> men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which, is, which was due. The average, I don't know what it is now, but 10 years ago, the average age of mortality for a homosexual was only 42 years of age. It's a life of destruction. The more the unregenerate rebel against God, the more corrupt and putrid they become. The souls of the unregenerate become old and hardened in sin. The punishment for sin is more sin, more corruption. More putrefication. And the unregenerate really are their own worst enemies. Proverbs 8.36 But he who sins against me wrongs his own soul. All those who hate me love death. The fountain or seed of evil impulses and desires is the flesh, the old man. <clears throat> Paul gives us an important insight on how the flesh or old man moves toward sinful action and is further corrupted. He says the old man grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. The sinful heart produces evil desires or lust. These evil desires lead to sinful behavior, which in turn contributes to the corruption of the flesh. Here's what Thomas Goodwin says. When thou hast seen, therefore, corrupt flesh as the root of all, then go and look to thy lusts. All the corruption that is in thy life, it is from the stirring of lusts in thee. All the corruption in the world is said to be through lusts. 2 Peter 1.4 And in this vein, James writes this, uh, James 1, 14 to 15 But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So we can't blame Satan for our sin. We can't blame the allurements and delights of the world. Yes, there's all kinds of temptations today. We can't blame these things for our sinful behavior. We must always blame ourselves. The old nature with which the Ephesians had uh, been on such intimate terms for so many years is not easy to shed. It's not easy to shed. Getting rid of it is difficult and painful. It amounts, in fact, Paul says, to a crucifixion, Romans 6, 6. This is true all the more because uh, it promises so much. 
it being continually corrupted through lusts, illusions, those deceptive evil desires, their mighty promises, and minimal performances. So when the devil works on you, or when temptations work on you, they're working on your flesh. They're working on your impulses. They're working on your illicit lusts. They're trying to stimulate. And, and when you fall, it's purely your fault because of your inward lust. Now, it's very important that we understand this term, lust. The word lust means a strong desire and can refer either to something, the desiring of something lawful and good or something unlawful and bad. There's nothing wrong, for example, for having a strong desire for one's wife, contrary to what the Pope said a number of years back. <clears throat> There's nothing wrong having a strong desire for food after not having anything to eat for several hours. Desires are a normal part of being a human being. They were given to man before the fall by God to help in the task of godly dominion, personal pleasure, and worship. They're part of who we are. The term lust in our day uh, has a primarily negative connotation because it is used in everyday speech to describe sinful lusts, particularly those associated with illicit sexual activities. But lust or strong desire can be a lawful, wonderful thing. Christians should never regard lust or sexual thoughts about a marriage partner as wrong and as positively good, once again contrary to Roman Catholicism. When people such as the Pope declare that all forms of lust are illegitimate, they're not following the Bible, they're following Neoplatonism, Greek paganism. Man in his original state was full of good desires. But because of the fall, there is a natural hatred of God and a natural hatred of spiritual good. That's why the natural man, the unregenerate man, cannot do anything that pleases God. He's at war with God. He's at enmity with God. Before them all uh, fall, fall <clears throat> men were to find their ultimate pleasure and satisfaction in God. After the fall, men apart from God seek ultimate satisfaction and pleasure in the service of self. The natural man walks continually according to his own ungodly lust, Jude 18. And here's Genesis 6, 5. Then the Lord saw the wick that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's the whole world. That's, just, that's not just uh, Congress. It's the whole world. When strong desires are continually directed toward unlawful activities of the flesh, uh, the flesh becomes habituated toward evil. Lusts act as the intermediary between the corrupt nature and actual sins. The committing of sins leads to the development of sinful habits, which in turn strengthens inner improper lust. Once again, a vicious cycle. There is a vicious cycle involved in committing sin. You need to be aware of it. The battle for sin always starts in your mind, in you. That's why Christ says, look, if you've already lusted after a woman in your heart, you're already guilty of adultery. You're, you're thinking about how you're going to go out and do something wrong. You have hatred in your brother in your heart. You want to punch somebody out. You're planning on beating them up. You've already sinned in your mind. There's the corrupt nature in this vicious cycle. There are habitual inclinations and dispositions of the mind which flow from sinful habits. Also, there is lust, which is the first moving of the mind and heart toward these unlawful deeds or objects. Now, of course, we must keep in mind that unlawful lust in itself is not a sin. Itself is not a sin, and the root or womb of sinful words and acts. Thus, James places lust as the cause of all sin, uh, James uh, 1, 14 to 15. Also, Paul even says that heresies, which are sins of the mind, intellect, or understanding, are properly reckoned among the lusts of the flesh. So if you start to lust in your mind and you immediately go, hey, the Bible says this is wrong, and you nip it in the bud, you haven't committed sin. 
you find yourself starting to lust, you've got to nip it in the bud. You've got to apply, you've got to preach to yourself. You've got to apply scripture to that and nip it in the bud. If you dwell on it, and then you start making plans to go out and do something wrong, you've committed sin in your heart. Well, conclusion. The Christian life is one of constant struggle and warfare against the old man, the flesh, and inner lusts. And there are a number of important things that we want to, by way of conclusion, remember in our battle against sin. Number one, recognize that we must deal with the remaining depravity in our nature until the day we die. You could be 95 years old, you could have been a Christian since the age of 12 years old, and that battle is still there. The corruption or the pollution of sin will not be eradicated until we go to heaven. And then finally, and then finally when we receive resurrected bodies at the second coming, that's when your redemption is complete, when your body is glorified. And your body cannot commit sin. Paul describes the inward indwelling principle or tendency towards sin as a law that we must always contend with. Always. It is always present, powerful, and contrary to holiness. Professing Christians who do not recognize or experience this law are deceived. They're hypocritical and they're not being honest with themselves or with Scripture. And once again, Wesley, this entire sanctification doctrine is, is a total disaster. Because if you think you're sanctified, you're not on guard. <clears throat> and then number two, we must also recognize that by virtue of our union with Christ in his life, death, and resurrection, we have victory over dominion of sin in our lives. We possess it. We have definitive sanctification, that is, an achieved and guaranteed full victory over sin in our lives by Jesus Christ. And the principle of holiness is communicated directly to us by the Holy Spirit at regeneration. Theologians refer to this as definitive sanctification. The principle of holiness and planning the new birth grows in progressive sanctification where every aspect of our being is more and more brought under the purifying influence of the Holy Spirit and God's law word. The more and more you learn scripture, the more and more the Holy Spirit applies scripture, the more and more and you cooperate with, with what the Bible teaches, the more and more you will be sanctified. We must constantly look upon Jesus' finished work and recognize that Christ's victory is our victory. All things have become new. The old man has passed away. To commit sin, therefore, is a contradiction to what we are in Christ. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 6. That's not who you are. The Jews say that Christianity will cause people to go out and sin as they please. And Paul says, no, no, no. That's not what a Christian is. A Christian has been sanctified in Christ and he hates that. He's not going to do that. All things have become new. The old man has passed away. We must live a life consistent to what we are, not what we used to be, the old man. We must continually put off our former conduct and put on righteous deeds or good works, biblically defined. And once again, the person to read on that, who's excellent, is Jay Adams, competent to counsel, the Christian Counselor's Manual. The name of the game of sanctification is identify sinful areas, ident identify sinful problems, put them off, replace them with a biblical counterpart. Recognition of the war within and our position in Christ should keep us on guard and in a humble state of reliance upon God's grace. Yet it should also fill our hearts with joy and hope. For Jesus has merited for us complete and total victory. We must look to Christ by faith and recognize his past as our past. We must continually pray for the Holy Spirit's assistance in this battle. For he enables us to obey, to put off the old man and put on the new. And we must constantly study God's word for defined sin and obedience. The Holy Spirit progressively uses the word of God to progressively sanctify our hearts. And, you know, when I was charismatic, I would go to churches where they didn't, people didn't read their Bibles, people didn't know what the Bible taught, and they didn't even know what sin, sin was. <clears throat> You've got people smoking pot on the way to church.
May God enable us to fight the good fight and live in a manner that pleases our precious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Understand the war we're in. Understand it's never going to end. Understand that victory is in Christ. Understand it's a process. Understand that you've got to continually put off and put on. And understand the necessity to always be watchful and always be on guard. As Jesus says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. <clears throat> watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The temptations will arise. But the question is going to be, are you going to immediately apply scripture to that and put the temptation away? Or are you going to toy with the temptation in your mind and end up giving in to a sin? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. You tell it like it is. You tell us exactly what the enemy is, what we need to do. Help us, Lord, to identify our problem areas. Help us to be watchful. Help us to understand that Christ is our victory. And help us to wage warfare continuously against these things. In Jesus' name, amen.